welcome everyone here this evening. Thank you for being here. Let's to, uh, take our Bibles now and focus our attention on the Word of God. <clears throat> topic that I've selected has been on my heart for a while, and I've decided that now's the time to talk about something that is very, very important to me and should be to us all. The passage that we are looking at, there are two of them that we're going to mention right at the start of the lesson. Of course, as they're listed on the screen, Ephesians 5, 19, where Paul writes to the brethren at Ephesus, telling them not to be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit. And then he explains how you can be filled with the Spirit. You speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Spiritual songs are things from the Spirit. And we can be filled with the things of the Spirit by speaking those things to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. But he explains what to do with those spiritual songs. You're to take those spiritual songs and you are to sing them. And while you're singing the words of the Spirit, you are to make melody in your heart to the Lord. A lot of times we miss the point of this verse, and I hope to make that point very clear. Making melody in the heart comes from a Greek word, It basically means to pluck, to pluck the strings. And so to make melody in the heart means to pluck the strings of the heart. There are certain strings of the heart that we'll talk about later on, but I'd like us to understand at the outset that making melody in the heart and singing and making melody in the heart, those are things that God wants us to do so that we can be filled with the Spirit. To fail to do that, to refuse to do that, means that you are not being filled with the Spirit. So it is very, very important to God to see that we are making our hearts available to be filled with the Spirit. That we're not to just mouth words, meaningless words that mean nothing to us as we sing them. Remember, Jesus said some people can draw near to him with their lips and honor him with their lips. He doesn't want us merely to sing, but he wants us to sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. One without the other one is no good, especially the part where he says to make melody in your heart to the Lord. The other passage is Colossians, which is a very similar book. But he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Very similar expression as being filled with the Spirit, by speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart. But here he is, instead of being filled with the Spirit, he switches his terminology. They equal the same thing. But letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Not merely memorizing some, some words. I remember coming up, those words were very important to be memorized as a, as a young boy growing up in, in the church. I remember those verses that we were called upon to memorize. I still remember them. They mean more to me now than they did then. But now, here's what he's saying. Let those words dwell in you in a rich way. That is, you soak them in. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you in a rich way. So you've got to be a student of the Word of God to let that happen. That's got to happen by means of soaking in and studying and meditating and reflecting upon the words that have come to us from Christ by the Holy Spirit. Now you to let those words dwell in you uh, richly in all wisdom. That is, you're to know how to apply them how to utilize them, and teaching and admonishing one another. 
in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So this is a, a group activity now that we are to do toward one another. And we're to do that singing with grace. You see the Word of Christ is dwelling in us richly and the Word of Christ tells us and we learn about this grace that has come to us through Christ. And so we sing with that in mind. We sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So we're speaking to one another but we also recognize that we're speaking to the Lord when we're doing these things. Have you ever looked at this, this, these two passages in their context, looking at the bigger context of the book itself and un- understood that he is not merely talking about singing without the instrument of, of the physical instrument that you saw combined to make melody in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it's, he's just really honing in on the fact That your singing is to be engaged with the melody made in the heart. And so there is something that we are to grasp from that that we did not see so readily in the Old Testament system. And I want you to consider with me the spiritual context of these two verses. Uh, Having read the one that David read just a moment ago in 1 Peter 2 where he says you are now a spiritual house. You are a spiritual temple. That's, That's in contrast to the physical temple that they had in the Old Testament system. But you are living stones and you're built into this spiritual house and you're not offering animal sacrifices and those kind of things anymore, but you are offering something spiritual that comes up from something being planted in your heart and then you're bringing it back up out of your heart to the Lord. So you're offering a spiritual sacrifice, Peter says, And that very point is made in these two books, Ephesians and Colossians. So let's just briefly just look at some verses in Ephesians to start with. I want you to notice Ephesians 1. And he mentions in uh, verse 3 that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And that will be important for us to remember the heavenly places in contrast to that temple that had physical compartments to it, physical places. You had the holy place in that physical temple and you had the most holy place in that physical temple. But now we have a spiritual house and we have a spiritual temple and we're we're being blessed with every spiritual blessing in these heavenly places which is another term for spirit, something that comes from heaven, that is connected with heaven, that's spiritual in its nature. And I want you to notice also verse 20, where he says, He worked things in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly. And some versions might go ahead in italics to put places because that's kind of implied. Instead of the earthly the temple made by hands, we've got the heavenly. And you will see also in this same verse, verse, oh, verse 20, uh, 23, that in his body, that is in his church, which is his body, verse 23, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What's that mean? Well, the vision that you had of the, from the Old Testament was when you got the temple ready and got it all cleaned and dedicated, then God's, God would come down in the form of either a fire by day or a, or a cloud by night, and, and the glory cloud would descend upon the temple, and then it would fill the most holy place, and thus indicating God was wanting to project a truth ahead of time. And that truth is that God wanted to fill us with His fullness so that we would be filled, that everybody, all, be filled with all, that He fills all of us. But we're not talking about a physical house anymore. We're not talking about an earthly temple or tabernacle made by hands anymore anymore. 
we're talking about in these heavenly realms. And then you'll notice also in chapter 2, verse 6, he says, He's raised us up together and made us sit together. We're sitting together. Did you get that? That we are raised up together with Christ and we are, He made us sit together in this is it a physical house that we're sitting in? Not, not with Christ. In Christ we are sitting together in the heavenly places in Christ. And then in verse 19 of chapter 2 he says, Now therefore you are no longer, talking to mostly a Gentile audience here, but he says, Therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And so what you're to envision by this is that we're, we're positioned and there is a connection of us being seated in a position and it is a spiritual position occupied first by Jesus as the chief cornerstone of this structure and the apostles being in this foundation. And then we're built up a spiritual house from that, grows together into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also being built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. Kind of like that earthly tabernacle was an illustration of this. But you are a spiritual house now and you occupy a heavenly position and you do not use the physical temple anymore and you do not use the animal sacrifices anymore. And I think you can see then as he's making these parallels all the way through the book that it should not surprise us that when he comes to, well, how do you... How, what else do you offer to God? And he says, you're to offer God your heart in song, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns because you're trying to be filled with the Spirit. You're wanting to become the reality that was only illustrated in that physical tabernacle or temple. And then in chapter 3, verse 19, he uses that expression again. He's praying that the love of Christ which passes knowledge would be something they better understood and kept grasping more and more. And he says, that you may be filled. There's that, that imagery again. With all the fullness of God. Knowing the love of Christ, that becomes the, the means by which God fills our hearts and all of us become filled with the love of Christ. Then you notice also in chapter 5, verse 2, notice the spiritual counterpart to that physical uh, sacrifice in the Old Testament. Now we got the spiritual again in chapter 5, verse 2. Walk in love. Been filled with love. I want you to walk in love. As Christ also has loved us. So there you're trying to compare your love for each other and love in general, principle for God, that you do that like Christ did. And then he, he describes it this, this way. As he loved us and has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. And in the Old Testament, they had to burn literal, physical incense that produced a physical aroma. God's not interested in that anymore. That was only to illustrate something else. And that was that you would be filled with the love of Christ and God would smell that coming from your life. That that's what God is really after. So now when we come to chapter 5 verse 18, he says, And be not drunk with wine in which is dissipation. That is where you start to dissipate spiritually. You start to die spiritually spiritually. 
he wants instead of that, instead of filling yourself with things that make you worse, I want you to fill yourself with the Spirit. And here's how. Speak to one another in Psalms. Psalms are pretty clear. You can look at the uh, book of Psalms as illustrations of Psalms to sing. Hymns and spiritual songs. We're not talking about any kind of uh, carnal song or worldly song. We're not talking about just singing anything. We're talking about singing a spiritually oriented song. Something that is based in spiritual truth. And I want you to sing, but when you sing, I want you to make sure that there is melody attached to that that is in your heart. That makes our singing so much more meaningful when you do that. And I want to explore that a little more in just a moment. But I said all that to say this, that you're looking at a book that takes, a, takes its spiritual examination of things from a physical counterpart in the Old Testament. In chapter 6, for example, again, he says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. Well, in the Old Testament, that meant an entirely different thing. They were to put on armor, physical armor. They had armies. But I'm asking Christians to be soldiers, but I'm asking you not to put on physical armor. Armor. I do want you to put on something very meaningful and very practical. But what's the nature of it again? It's not to wrestle with flesh and blood as you saw them wrestle in the Old Testament for land holdings. Not merely that, but to also take from an evil land and evil people something that now should belong to the people of God. But they did that with physical battles only to illustrate the importance of of the spiritual battle. And so he goes on to talk about the spiritual armor that we're to take on. So we do have an army too. We are a nation too. We do have a temple too. But we do not use physical temples and we do not fight physical battles. So the counterpart, of course, is to illustrate with the physical so that you could understand the spiritual. And that's his point here in Ephesians 5 verse 19 about singing and making melody in your heart because I already told you about making melody on the instrument of ten strings in the Old Testament. But the counterpart is the strings of the heart now. You can see that again in the book of Colossians. Colossians 2 verse 11 for example Uh, He's already talked about the fact that we've been translated out of darkness and into a kingdom of God's dear Son. And so the nature of it would be something that knew no territorial bounds as far as earthly territory. But it could be anywhere and everywhere. But then in chapter 2 verse 11 he says, In him you, and he's speaking again to a largely Gentile congregation of people. There were some Jews there. But in him you were also circumcised. That was characteristic. Physical circumcision was characteristic of the Jews, the Israelite people in the Old Testament. Physical circumcision was. But then he says, but you also are circumcised with a circumcision. And underscore this next phrase, made without hands. Why? Because this temple that we're building is made without hands. This nation that we're building is a nation built without hands. The, the armory that we, armor that we use to fight these battles that we fight are without physical hands. And so it would be natural then for him to then show, show us a spiritual counterpart to the circumcision they went, underwent in the Old Testament. He says, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Well, how did that happen? By putting off the body of sins of the flesh. You cut those off. And how did you do that? You did that by the circumcision of Christ. Christ did that. When did he do it? 
when you were buried with him in baptism in which you are also raised with him through faith. This is a circumcision that took place by faith, through faith, when you were united with Jesus in baptism. And that's when he cut your sins off. That's when you were spiritually circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Now, baptism is, of course, something that you are to undergo. Somebody else is lowering you down into the water, but you're doing that by faith in Jesus Christ, and he's the one taking his hands that are not physical, and he's cutting off sins that are not physical things. He's cutting those things off. And so a circumcision has taken place. Now, in two, chapter 2, verse 17, after talking about Somebody judging you about uh, Sabbath. He says, don't let anybody judge you in regard to food and drink. Verse 16. Or regarding new moons or Sabbaths. Why? Because that was part of the Old Testament system. And we're not under the Old Testament system. Why? Because Jesus took that out of the way, verse 14, and nailed it to his cross. And therefore, don't let anybody judge you in regard to those things. But notice what he calls those things in verse 17. He says those things are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance is of Christ. So it is clear then that we have now a substance in Christ and the Old Testament dietary laws and the Sabbaths and new moons and festivals, all those things were shadows of these, these things that we have in Christ. I said all that just to get us to see in the context that when he says sing and make melody in your heart, he did not just say that randomly with no meaning behind it. The meaning captivates the spiritual strings of the heart that is the replate, that's the substance of what was illustrated by the plucking of the strings of the Old Testament physical harp or psaltery. Now, with that in mind, we ask this question. Why were the carnal physical instruments dropped by the early church? And I don't know of any exceptions. Is there a, a scholar who has studied the times of the early church who would not admit that the early Christians, as a general rule, it was a fact that they did not use the animal sacrifices and they did not use the burning of incense and they did not use the instruments of music. The carnal instruments were dropped. And we ask the question, why? Well, it's because... And maybe this, the best passage to illustrate this would be from Hebrews chapter 9. If you're studying with, with someone, use this because it's very important for people to understand the difference between the two covenants. In chapter 9 of Hebrews, he says the first covenant, verse 1, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. Remember we were looking at Ephesians about the heavenly and now we are talking about the old first covenant had that earthly sanctuary. He says a, a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle was called the holiest of all. That's the place that had these particular things. Dropping down to verse 8, he says, From all of this, the Holy Spirit was indicating something. What was he indicating? Well, he was indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all, the real holiest of all, was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic. All of those things were symbolic for the present time. That is, they were talking about something that has now come to us in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience because 
They were concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings. Remember Colossians says, don't let anybody judge you about those things anymore because Jesus nailed those to the cross. He says they were fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. God planned to reform things. So we're not going to continue to use the physical tabernacle, the physical offerings and sacrifices. We're not going to continue to use it. There is a time of reformation. Those things were just indicators of that. But notice in verse 11 he says, Christ as high priest of the good things to come with greater and more perfect tabernacle. That's what we're in now. The greater and more perfect tabernacle. And notice the nature of it. It's not made with hands. First one was. Second one is not. It's not made with hands. That is, it's not of this creation. Now, if you're going to sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord, you're going to have to make that melody come from a very unique place. That is, it's not from a place of this creation made with hands. Now, material, physical, carnal instruments would be made with physical hands. But we're talking about a place, a spiritual house in which you do not use those things made by hands. That is, not of this creation. And then in verse 24, he mentions that again. Verse 23, let's pick up there. He says, therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens, remember, we are now in the heavenly places in Christ. But the copies of those things, that would be the Old Testament things, they, uh, he says, should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. So we've got to have different kinds of sacrifice for this different kind of tabernacle. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us all. So why were they dropped Historically, they were dropped for a reason. They were dropped because they realized we are now in the time of reformation where we do not continue those things that we used in the Old Testament system, those things made by hands. So I want you to make melody in your heart. That's very clear, very precise. In fact, don't let anybody judge you about why you don't use, why you don't uh, observe those Sabbaths, why you don't observe those dietary laws. Don't let anybody judge you as to why you don't use instruments of music. You ought to be able to tell them the reason I don't is because we're in the time of reformation in which you do not continue to use those things that were used as a part of the Old Testament system that were made by hands. Our circumcision is a circumcision done without hands. Our house that we enter into is not a house made by hands. It is a spiritual house. We are in a time of reformation in which all of the shadows of the law have been dropped and we are now in a temple that is now spiritual in its nature. The temple is spiritual. The circumcision is now spiritual. The armor that you use to fight with is now spiritual. The melody to singing is now spiritual. It is in the heart. And thus we conclude that the time of reformation called for reforming from physical to spiritual instruments whether it is an instrument of animal sacrifice, an instrument to offer literal incense, or whether it is an instrument by which you would make melody in the Old Testament physical system. Now with that in mind, let no one tell you that, oh, y'all don't use instruments because that's a Church of Christ doctrine. First of all, Let's understand, 
The church that belongs to Christ submits to Jesus Christ. And because we submit to Jesus Christ, we believe that the things that we offer to Him in sacrifice should be those things that are of a spiritual nature that come from the heart, not from the skill of someone playing on an instrument. That is because the Spirit told us about the spiritual nature of this kingdom and the spiritual nature of this temple and the spiritual nature of the melody that we're to assist our songs with. And so assist your songs, but make sure you're assisting your songs with the melody made from the heart. So now let us learn to do that. I didn't want to just spend all our time on that. I do want to get to the main point. Now that being a very important point that everybody needs to understand that. Let's now shift gears into the actual learning of that. Because it's very easy and I'm not, going, I'm not casting judgment on anybody but myself. And sometimes I do it right and sometimes I don't. So I know there are times when I'm, I'm engaged and I know there are times when I'm not. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know, except maybe over a period of time, the fruit of my life may show, may show that, as was pointed out in the lesson this morning. The fruit of the, of the person's life would show that they're not singing and making melody in their heart. But you might not know that at that one service. You might not know it at two services. You might not know it at three services. But you might begin to figure it out that he's getting weaker and it seems like if he's getting weaker, he must not be singing and making melody. He must not be filled with the Spirit. See, he must be filling himself with discouragement. He must be filling himself with something else. And so then you might figure out over a period of time that a person is getting weaker, then they're not filling themselves with the Spirit. So now we've got to learn how to effectively use our moments together. And one of the most important things is... We've got to make sure before we get here that we are in tune with God first. That's why we come here. I know you can do something out of habit. I know that. I did that for many, many years, do something out of habit, out of expectation and not engage the heart. And as we said, Jesus says, this people draws near to me with their mouths and with their lips and their heart are far from me. And I think we can understand what that means. Now, to effectively use the spiritual heart, the spiritual instrument that is to assist our songs, we have to tune our heart strings to give God your very best. It is disheartening. I've heard some song leaders say it's just disheartening to look out and I see some people and they're not, they're not moving their mouths. They're not singing. And then there are those that are. Now, some people can sing and they get weaker spiritually. Why? Well, it's because they're not engaging their heart. They're, they're singing vocally, but they're not engaging their heart. And others are engaging their heart and they're, they're solid, they're strong, they continue to be strong, they seem to be getting stronger as time goes on because they are engaging, they're tuning their heart strings, they're tuning them up. Life tries to tries to get to the heart and tries to get us out of tune and get us out of sorts. But the Spirit of God is calling for us to be in tune with God. You understand that point? I hope you do. So when you sing, you pluck strings of your heart. How do you do that? Well, you have certain what we would call emotional heart strings that have to be plucked. That means you have to engage your heart strings. And there are a variety of strings of the heart. I would suggest to you several of them. For example, we have a, we have a string of the heart that seems to be dedicated to, to hoping for good things ahead. And when I think about songs that like sing to me of heaven... Get your heart string going. 
Don't just, don't just get your mouth going, but get your heart string going with that and just really think about going to heaven. I know that the song leader has a job to try to, to keep us in order. And that's very important that we have order and we know what, what's coming and what we're, what we're doing together. But probably the one, the, and maybe I can say without exception, the most important thing of all is that I engage my heart strings, the emotional part of my heart, so that I'm really thinking, what's it going to be like to be with God in heaven? First Peter talks about uh, the fact that, that we have a, a hope that's alive. It's a living hope. And, and he's gone and he's reserved us a place in heaven. Well, that means then I've got to keep my heart in tune with that. I want to be in tune with going to heaven. I don't want to get out of tune. And I know that a lot of times it's easy to get out of tune and lose your hope and lose your focus. So pluck those strings. Get them in tune. You know what it means to tune an instrument. That means if it, it doesn't sound right unless it's in tune. And you, don't, you are not spiritually filled with the Spirit unless you are tuned right. And your heart, tune, your heart string of hope is tuned with that. You're in tune with hope. What about love? That's, a, that's also an emotional part of our being, that we love Him because He first loved us and that He loved us when we were at our worst and, and that uh, He poured out the love of Christ has been poured out into our hearts by the gospel. Well, that means then I've got to get my heart string in tune with God's love. He loved me at my worst. He loves me now as I'm trying to do better than I was. He loves me. And i got to get in tune with that. And that was one of the points that we already saw in the book of Colossians and also Ephesians chapter 3. What about real faith? I mean faith that's on fire, that's zealous. Is your faith on fire? Is, are, are the emotional strings of your heart, are they in tune with God? Or have they just kind of gotten out of tune? And what about thankfulness? You know, Philippians 4 talks about being anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Well, that's a part of the heart where I'm, I'm really thankful. And I think about things to be thankful for. And when I come to services and we're singing about different things, spiritual things especially. I'm so thankful for those things because that gives me hope and that gives me a chance. Get your heart tuned with thankfulness. And what about reverence and respect and godly fear and adoration? Revelation 4 talks about this throne scene and, and the elders throw their crowns down at the feet of this one who is sitting on the throne and, and they're saying words like holy, holy, holy. When I sing that word, that song, holy, 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 I mean, it, it just runs chills up my spine because that vision of John comes to mind every time I sing that song or, or a song like that about the majesty of God. When you sing songs... Don't just mutter the words, but think about them. And get your heart in gear and in tune with that song. Because that's so important because that helps you to be filled with the Spirit. And that helps you to be strong as God wants you to be. And of course, real compassion. We could probably be saying, look at all these strings of the heart that we play when we're singing and making melody in our heart. We're plucking those strings the song may be about heaven or it may be about the grace of God or it may be faith is the victory or it may, it may be a variety of things. But there are heart strings that are touched and should be touched by our songs and singing and making melody in the heart. So I want to just close with asking us to do that. Let's try to think about what we're singing and engage our hearts, tuning the strings. If they're out of tune, get them in tune. Well, there can be no melody made in the heart unless the heart is in tune. 
And let me say this. I, I made this point to a degree just a moment ago, but I would like to say this again. I can't judge anybody else but me. But sometimes I think back, and at more recently I've been to become more sentimental, I guess. I look back to days when I was growing up in Union Springs, Alabama, that little old small congregation, and I can hear that singing. And then I hear the singing here. And I say, you know what? That is a wonderful sound. You get to hear all these voices telling and confessing and saying, Jesus is worth this spiritual sacrifice. Now, I say this because I want us to do this even better. We gauge other people as lifeless because sometimes we are lifeless. And so we assume that's not a good assumption. Just because I may be lifeless in my service does not mean everybody is. So let's practice thinking in terms of the only person I can, I can get the heart in tune with God is me. I can't, I can't determine anybody else's heart. I can encourage by singing, and I can encourage them by singing when I make melody in my heart and it starts showing in my life. But we will gauge others spiritually lifeless sometimes because our own hearts have become lifeless and then we assume everybody's just like me. That's not a fair judgment. Sometimes others are very spiritually charged and very spiritually in tune with God, and I'm not. So I can't judge whether anybody else but me is in tune when we're singing. I know this, that if a person is offering song, there's a good chance they're singing and making melody in their heart. There's a good chance they're not making melody in their heart. But I guess our only thing that we can assume is that they are. But God sees the truth. God is not pleased with us just merely mouthing some words. So let's not do that. If we've been doing it, let's quit it. But let's look at ourselves every time and reverently Take those words that are on the page and let them filter through our hearts and let them strum and stroke this tune and, uh, and pluck those, those strings of the heart. And God will be pleased. He will not see people who just honor Him with their lips and their heart is far from Him. So self-examination is so important it is so important that we get our heart in tune with God personally. That's the only person you can take care of. And that's the only person I can take care of is my heart. And you take care of your heart. And then let's sing and speak melody from our heart to God and to one another. Get in tune with God. If you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, repentance is how you, uh, you turn things around and start to get in tune. Repentance means I'm going to tune in to God. I've been tuning out, now I'm tuning in. That's how it happens. And if you're here this evening, you realize you've gotten out of tune with God and you need to get back in tune, repentance, and pray God that perhaps the thoughts of your heart may be forgiven you. Get back in tune with God, sing and make melody in your heart from here on out. If we can help you with that, please come as we stand together and